Our next section is about pediatric laryngoscopy and intubation. The incidence of difficult airway management in children is far less than the incidence in adults. Uh, they are easier to intubate. The problem is we are more stressed doing so. And what that stress does, especially in pediatrics, is work against our success. And so, you know, we are eager to jump in and get the tube in. It leads us, because we're stressed, to overgrip the laryngoscope, overinsert it, to run past all structures. We're going to go over these anatomic differences, but the larynx is higher. The uvula and epiglottis are frequently touching. So in the littlest of children, the infants, the neonates, the epiglottis and the uvula are touching. Our exaggerated stress response tends, uh, tends to make us overgrip the laryngoscope, overinsert it. We then get deep to all the structures, and we're looking at pink mush, and we can't get this airway. When in fact, you know, it gets back to the same basics that we've been talking about all along, epiglottoscopy, tongue control, improving laryngeal exposure, and delivering the tube. But most of the errors in Pete's laryngoscopy happen at the beginning with failure to do proper epiglottoscopy and failure to understand why the epiglottis is so high in children. So we're going to go over the uh, anatomic differences, and they include differences in sort of the proportions of structures, the size of structures, but this business that the epiglottis and the larynx are higher in the neck. And there's a reason for that. It has to do with breastfeeding, which I'm going to show you an image of explains why the epiglottis and the uvula uh, need to oppose one another in order to breastfeed. But, you know, children have a small thyromental distance. That small thyromental distance means you have less displacement space. They have relative macroglossia, i.e., the tongue is large. Now, the good news is that the size of pediatric tubes are small relative to the blades we're using during laryngoscopy. So in general, tube delivery in children is more forgiving than in adults. We're less likely to block the line of sight as we intubate children. But we're working in smaller spaces easier to overrun the epiglottis and go too far in. And because of that small distance from the oropharynx to the larynx, there has been a tendency not to use hyperangulated curve, you know, hyperangulated video laryngoscope blades. And there are, thankfully now, small video laryngoscope blades down to low sizes that come in a Mac shape and several companies offer small video laryngoscope blades that are Miller blades. Historically, Miller blades were recommended in the tiniest of children so as to control the epiglottis and to sort of go along this larger relative tongue size and the epiglottis being relatively stiff and difficult contr to control and I'm going to show you pictures how the epiglottis is frequently omega-shaped. So there are a number of these anatomic issues, but combining them with our sort of proclivity to overgrip the laryngoscope, to overinsert, uh, that's what causes us problems with little ones, even though actual intubation in them is in fact technically easier. The other thing that's important to remember in children is that they have, especially the littlest ones, their cartilages are not developed. And their trachea, their thyroid, their cricoid, their tracheal cartilages, they're all more susceptible to collapse as you increase negative inspiratory force. And a little bit of mucus, a little bit of edema in a tiny airway can cause a significant impairment in the actual flow through that airway increasing the work of breathing dramatically. And then because they have less developed muscles around their thorax, they fatigue easier. And that's how the littlest ones, for instance, with RSV, uh, for example, get into trouble. So the smaller lumen means more vulnerable to edema,
fluids and obstruction, uh, increased work of breathing with less musculature, strider, ultimately fatigue, and the need for uh, intubation. And by the way, when we were discussing O's up the nose, high flow nasal cannula can overcome a lot of that problem and has become sort of the um, de facto sort of approach to assisting work of breathing in neonates because they are obligate nasal breathing, obligate nasal breathers. So taking a look at this anatomy, we have in children a larger tongue relative to the pharynx. So you can see here how this tongue, and here's the hard palate, there's a lot of space here compared to the child. The larynx is at the level of C3 instead of C5. The nostrils uh, are smaller, and the infants are obligate uh, nasal breathers. This displacement space relative to the tongue, this distance is longer relative to the volume of the tongue. So higher position, uh, oh, and larger occiput, all of these factors contribute to sort of this problem of controlling the tongue, controlling the epiglottis, and of making it easier uh, to overrun landmarks on insertion. When we look in the mouth of small children, and in this case, uh, I think this is a six or seven year old, and this is a teenager, we often can see the epiglottis. This is a reflection of the fact that the epiglottis is in a higher location than in adults. In most adults, it is unusual to look in the oropharynx and see the epiglottis edge. But here we have the uvula, and it is almost touching uh, the epiglottis in this child who opens up their airway well. And notice you have this kind of omega shape. I did show you in one of the adults, a very large obese person, that I think we also see this omega epiglottis in significant obesity. And we discussed some of the difficulties of intubating around that and using the MAC as a miller to control that difficult to control epiglottis. Well, in children, part of the rationale of using miller blades, straight blades, especially in the smallest, has to do with the mechanical difficulties of trying to control that epiglottis. So uh, I was told during my training, and I sort of remember hearing that the larynx is higher up in children than in adults. But it really didn't resonate with me. It really didn't stick with me until I saw these images uh, from this book, which I think are extraordinary because what it shows is in order to breastfeed, the soft palate, in this case, here's the uvula and the soft palate, it has to touch the epiglottis. So infants take milk in, they hold it in this upper airway in their oropharynx, they breathe through their nose behind the fluid which they're holding, and then they swallow going down the esophagus, and then they fill this space again and breathe. So when you watch infants breastfeed, you see them suck, and then they flare their nostrils as they're breathing, taking in the air, oxygen behind the stored fluid, then they swallow, then they repeat the cycle. As adults, the epiglottis and the uvula no longer touch. As we age, the larynx descends. So here you can see, here's the bottom of two, uh, C2. So we're at C2, three in the level of the cords. Here, we're at two, three, four, five. We're almost down at five. And the jaw has grown, uh, the neck has expanded, the larynx has kind of descended. So we can no longer hold fluid in our uh, mouth and breathe behind it because this soft palate and epiglottis no longer oppose each other as they do in infancy. But this is a clear visualization of why RSV is problematic. Um, why when children can't breathe through their nose, they're gonna have significant difficulties with feeding, 
and subsequently with breathing because they then try to breathe, but if they can't breathe through their nose, they can't feed, and uh, you know we're not giving decongestants to these little ones, so you know, aggressive use of bulb suction, et cetera, et cetera, but um, this is why uh, nasal congestion and breastfeeding and infancy and small airways, this is how all this can be a problem in the setting of RSV and other URI, severe URIs. When we look at kids below the age of eight, it's said that we should not do surgical airways as in open crikes on them. And historically, people have suggested that you want to do jet ventilation. I'm going to cover at the end of this talk that I think we should not do jet ventilation, but there is a way to use a small cannula catheter through or into the trachea. And I'm going to show you that. It's called the vent train, and I think it's far safer than jetting. But it is important to note that in children, there is a lot more trachea out of the neck. So in this diagram from the same book, you can see all of these tracheal rings. And all of these tracheal rings are visible in infants. And the smallest infants, when they tilt their head back, you can just clearly see, like a garden hose, uh, the trachea. Now in adults, so about 10 rings in an infant are visible outside of, above the sternal notch. In an adult, it's four to six. So um, we do surgical airways at the cricothyroid membrane, the CTM, in adults. But below the age of eight, this space is too small. But the landmarks to do a tracheotomy are easier. And certainly the landmarks to identify the trachea are easier. And I'm going to show you a needle-guided system of active insufflation, but also active um, ventilation exchange, um, something called a vent train. Uh, and I think, you know, in the rare instances, we need to uh, use a small lumen catheter to try to oxygenate and ventilate the child. It's far better than uh, what we historically had in the past. But we'll get to that. I just wanted to point out that it is easier to do trachs in children, or at least localize the trachea. And we'll come back to when, on very rare occasion, we need to do or consider or coordinate with our surgeons doing an emergency trach in the smallest of patients. So pediatric airway edema has a much greater impact on flow than in adult airways. So if you have a tiny infant and their airway is four millimeters and they get a millimeter of edema on the wall, what that means is you have a millimeter here, you have a millimeter on this side, and you're left out of that four millimeters. Your lumen, you've taken off one on either side, your lumen is now down to two millimeters. In an adult, if you add a millimeter of edema, you went from eight millimeters to six, so you had a 25% reduction. But here, you had a 50% reduction. We already mentioned that these little ones have very little musculature, and so that's why we see, as their negative inspiratory force goes up, we see the rib retractions, we see the belly breathing, because they don't have the musculature that adults have to assist uh, with breathing, and that's how they get into increased resistance and strider and ultimately fatigue. 